Hey, hey, ho, ho, at the elephants. Welcome to the show. We're doing it. It's your host, Rob Morris. I'm here. I'm back. I got another episode for you this very week. We're doing two a week for the rest of 2022. Uh, maybe a few exceptions, but I got so many great episodes with so many great people uh, that I'm putting them out twice a week. That's how often we're doing it. So thank you everyone for tuning in. Thanks for uh, sticking with us and 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 checking out all these episodes. Uh, I've been looking at the analytics and it looks like a lot of the people who watch one episode, they're watching all of them, which I really appreciate. Um, it is, wait, let me check my calendar here. Holy shit, it's November. We're in November 2022. Can you believe it? I got a great episode for you today as we, um, you know, close out the fall season. Jared Thompson. Jared Thompson was one of the first friends I made in Winston-Salem when I moved to North Carolina to go to school from Texas originally. Uh, Jared's from the Charlotte area. And he was finishing his second year of drama school. And I moved there at the end of the year. We're going to get into this a little bit, but I moved to North Carolina to go to School of the Arts because my best friend growing up in Texas, Brandon Harris, was already in the drama school and finishing his second year. And I had taken like community college and gap year and all this shit. And he convinced me to come to School of the Arts. I moved to Winston-Salem, North Carolina, didn't know anybody. And as soon as I got there, about three weeks later, Brandon left and he went to Europe for three months. The whole summer he went to go to Europe and go uh, bicycling with Drew Perrin and some other people and left me in Winston-Salem for the summer to get a job and figure out this new chapter of my life. And one of the first people that I met and became close with was Jared Thompson. And we became fast friends. We spent the whole summer together with a, a slew of other people who decided to stay in Winston over the summer. And I cannot say enough nice things about this guy. Um, I think about all of the friends and, and dare I say family that I made while I was at school. And Jared is one of the nearest and dearest people to my heart. Um, we had Wiley Gorn on the show recently. Wiley and Jared are in this family of people. When I think of them and they, they enter my mind at all, it, it's just light. It's just bright light. They, they're so warm. There's so much kindness and so much openness to the world. You know, uh, I think there's a great amount of cynicism at School of the Arts, at least when I was there, and skepticism and, uh, dare I say, negativity. That is great. That is essential to an artist community. You need that. You need the people that are like, this sucks and this is bullshit. Like it, too much of it can be a little toxic. I have contributed to it myself for sure. Uh, but you also need the other side. You need those people who are seemingly perpetually looking for the light and looking for the things that bring joy and inspiration and lift you up. And Jared Thompson, Drama 2010, he is one of these people. Um, we have gone out to the woods and done mushrooms together and we have uh, partied and we have made art and we have uh, lived and laughed and loved together. And like I said, when I think about Jared, I just think about light and joy and gratitude. I am so deeply grateful to talk to Jared. Um, we're going to get into it today about uh, his journey in clowning and comedy. He's really been doing uh, a lot of comedy lately and kind of uh, sidestepped a little bit of the conventional acting work uh, for clowning and doing comedy and taking his unique take on being a clown into the world of stand-up, which obviously, if you know anything about me, it's been a big part of my life. I've been a stand-up nerd since I was a kid. I started doing stand-up in 2016, ran a comedy club in Austin, Texas. And speaking of Austin, Texas, that is where Jared has recently relocated. Uh, we recorded this episode. This is actually the first episode I recorded for this new season. And we recorded this episode when he was still living in Arkansas. So as you listen to the episode, you're going to hear us talk about him being in Arkansas, how he got there, what he's doing there. But since we recorded this, he has made his transition 
uh, to living in Austin, Texas, and is getting involved in a comedy scene that I just left a year ago. Um, so I'm very excited for him to get involved in that and to take his humor and his spirit and his gratitude and all the great things I just said about him to that city that very much uh, deserves to have him there. Um, I will say, if you're watching this episode, if you're listening to it on uh, Apple Podcasts or Spotify or Stitcher, you're not even going to notice this, but for those of you who are tuning into the YouTube episode, you will notice that a little early in the episode, my image uh, below Jared's, because this is like a vertical video and, that I recorded, and Jared's uh, got a great image. Uh, he's got a great microphone. The quality is excellent. Um, because of an error that is purely my fault, my image on the bottom half is going to freeze and just stay still for the majority of the episode and then it'll start moving around again uh, at the end. It's not you, it's me. It's not uh, your television, it's not your phone, it's not your computer that's making that happen. Um, it was a video error that happened on my end. So what I did was just take a freeze frame and kind of stretch it out so at least there's something there. Um, but let's get to it. Let's get to this episode that I am so happy to share with you with the curious Jared Thompson. How are you doing, man? Doing really good, man. Yeah. I, uh, just, uh, talking with you about like, have I meant, I mentioned to you, I was a part of like this mastermind I'm doing right now. Yeah. Yeah. And then you broke down what that even means. Cause that was confusing to me. Yeah. Like, what, exactly. what is a mastermind it, other than me? Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Right. Uh, it's, um, it's basically a, it's led by normally led by one coach, but then the, it's meant to create a, a single vision. Um, this mastermind is specifically for cre uh, creating your business or improving upon your business. And then they, that vision just goes towards the end of a, however long it is, this one's 12 weeks. And so it's like um, a workshop program. Yes, your something like that. And way. like the people that are in the group creates this, this, um, mastermind where it's just a, like a unified vision to where everybody's inspiring each other with what they're doing. And, um, the more that you get that inspiration from each other, the, you know, the stronger the mastermind is. Who came up with this concept, you know? I am, I'm not really sure. And that is actually my own definition of what it is. Um, cause that's just what it feels like to me. Uh, but I'm not really sure. I'm, I imagine that it, it was started by who knows what Tony Robbins or something like it sounds like the, some Tony Robbins shit. Yeah. Like who was the first, who was the first entrepreneur that like self-help guy? Yeah, yeah. For sure Tony's the if, most if successful. The, I of feel all like time. he's the grandfather of that of of that for sure. Yeah, I don't know who was selling like VHS tapes or something before he came around, but he definitely <laughs> capitalized right. on the whole model for sure. He made it what it is. Yeah. So, let let's back up a little bit here and start at the beginning-ish. The last time that you did this show, I mean, I've been doing this show for 8 years, but not consistently. I know you were one of the first guests. You were in like episode two or something like that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Talking about your blue man group audition. <laughs> That's so wild. How long ago does that feel? The blue oh, man thing. You know, it, it actually feels a really long time ago. Um, that, and I, I don't know. You hear people say like, Oh, it just felt like yesterday. I'm like, no, it, it feels like it wasn't even my life. Like it feels like I, it was, this may sound weird, but like another, another person. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's been, it's been a while since we had that conversation. And if, if, you know, it's a billion years ago, but it'll be on the same channels ish. If anyone wants to go back and listen to that story, it's a great story only because, um, it's a famous thing. It's such a big yeah. thing. And you're, you kind of really let people into the process of how to have, and I had no idea how it, how does one become a blue man? I don't even think I realized till I talked to you for sure that it wasn't the same three fucking dudes the whole time. 
Yeah. I was like, what do you mean audition to be a blue man? That's like audition to be in the Rolling Stones, right? Like you don't get to be like, I'll be the next Mick Jagger. Right, like I thought right. It was like, there's only so many. But um, I loved hearing about that. And then of course, right around the time that that was happening, you were getting the Simpletons started with Ian and Andrew. Yeah. Oh, and that, man. That That's really wild. Kinda, I didn't even think about that. It snowballed then into that really being your the next step in your clowning, which I can't wait to talk about how much we dove into that word uh, recently. Mm. So uh, I'll kind of lay it out for everybody listening. You know, Jared and I were at school at the same time, not the same class. Um, I was 13, drama, you were 10. Um, and But we were there at the same time and we met right after I moved to Winston, which was like at the end of your second year. and. Uh, because of the nature of everybody mostly leaving for the summer, Brandon Harris was my hookup for School of the Arts, and he left to go to Europe for three months as soon as I moved there. So I had no friends in town except for the people I met in the month of May, which is a weird time to meet people at School of the Arts. Like when you meet people, it's generally at the top of the year, or maybe it's at summer session, or maybe it's even like you came to see a play in the middle of the year. Meeting people in May, like when the school year's wrapping up and all that's going on are like project <laughs> presentations and final shows and shit like that. It's kind of a weird, I don't know how to describe it other than it's fast. You like everything's going really fast and everyone's in a yeah. hurry to either get out or do their shit. We met uh, through Brandon and some other mutual friends and you were one of the few people who kind of stayed in Winston for a lot of the summer. Because yeah, that's right. You're from Charlotte. So it was like not a big deal. You could go see your family. So, you know, it wasn't a huge thing for you to stay in town like it was for people who are out of state. And we spent that summer and kind of became fast friends. Um, you were also dating my roommate at that time. Yes. And, and so you were always over at the house and we were like, you know, buddies making her the third wheel sometimes because we were playing <laughs> video games and shit when she was yeah. like, let's go be boyfriend, girlfriend. And you're like, we got to finish Resident Evil 5. But then... Or watching like a, a, a stand-up. Yeah, or whatever. stand-up stuff that you had. Yeah, whatever it was at the time. So that's how we kind of met. Um, you know, fast forward over our time at school together. Did mushrooms a bunch of times together. Did a lot of... Uh, yeah, I forget that part. <laughs> that's the point, I oh, think, yeah. <laughs> is to do that. Uh, had some eye-opening experiences together. And um, yeah, we, we kind of stayed friends. And then when I got out of school, I started at the Elephants. You were one of the first people that I called to talk about what you were up to and, and just mm. kind of catch up on your work. We talked about Blue Man. We talked about the beginning of Simpletons. And you really seemed to be... We've talked about this before. So many people leave school. They don't even know what they're going to get into. But you yeah. have really, you really doubled down in a way, I don't, whether consciously or subconsciously, and you could tell me, on the clowning. That was like mm. the thing that you connected to clearly at school because you're right out the gate. You're like, I'm doing blue man auditions. I'm doing this red nose thing in the city with my homies that we went to school together. And you kind of still... Still to this day, that is a lot of your focus is the clowning, is the comedy, is the physical, yeah. um, the physical work. You know, some people latch on to combat and then they leave acting school and they end up they fucking they're a combat guy, they're a stunt guy. Yeah. Um, I, I don't know if you know uh do you know Tim Ulick? I hope I'm saying his last name right. That but name sounds familiar. A few years ahead of you, became a big stunt guy. He recently uh, did everything everywhere all at once. Oh, dude, gosh, which that holy movie shit rocks is like my world. Oh, it's so dope. He's the fight guy. No kidding. Yeah, it's one of our homies. I mean, not the only Michelle Yeoh, obviously, is like the right. queen. So she probably only needs so much help. But there's a lot of non combat people doing combat in that, doing uh, stunts and shit in that. And he had I a lot to do with so that. Um, so people go in different directions, but you really latched onto the clowning stuff. And we didn't, uh, you know, after that last interview, we both kind of have been on separate paths. I ended up going into stand up uh, for a while, running a comedy club for a while. And recently, and this is, I, I promise this is full circle, setting us up to kind of catching us up to where we are. I'm on Instagram. I've been following your comedy stuff lately. 
and I fr- I get suggested by the algo to check out this live. <laughs> the freaking algo. The algo is like, hey, bro, algo. <laughs> You need to I'll go check out Jared. He's oh, talking. You're there, talking to this. There it is. Hey, <laughs> you're talking to this dude Mal about here. about how to do how to get your comedy up to the next level of where it belongs. Really, is what I was hearing. Yeah. And then the guy kind of goes, "I don't know if you know anybody who's more in the comedy world." And I'm like, "Hello, what's <laughs> up? I'm one of your like oldest friends. You like, let's talk about this." A few minutes later. You give me a call and we end up talking for over an hour on the phone yeah, or even more. Yeah. I think it was definitely, it was, it was quite a while. We ended up it's talking been a on while the phone. since we had spoke too. Yeah. 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 It had, that's what I'm saying. It was like this, literally I'm thinking in my head, simpletons, blue man. That's mm. the last kind of touchstone I had with you, which was like eight years ago. And then just vaguely noticing like you're going to mics, open mics. I should be more clear. You're going to comedy places where they do stand up, but you're bringing your brand of comedy performance to it and watching the audience kind of react uh, to like, w- are you going to talk about the airport or like, <laughs> what's the, what are we doing? And you kind of, you kind of brought some stuff up to me that I'd love to maybe if you're into it, kind of rehash your journey to that uh, sure. for people and, and talk about some of the stuff we brought up, which is, you know, really where, where do you go from here with wanting to be funny and wanting to make people laugh? And Mm -hmm. so talk to me about that. Can can you take me a little bit from like end of Simpleton's era in New York and kind of get us to, you're in Fayetteville, Arkansas? Yeah. I'm in Fayetteville right now. Catch me up, dude. What's the path? Yo, yo, that's awesome. It's cool to, to think about it too. And I didn't even think about it. Just the fact that right after blue man, it was the Simpletons. Um, yeah, uh, I when the Simpletons. Um, so it was me, Andrew Jernigan, and Ian Ontall. We, we um, so Andrew Jernigan we, of the Night Spins. Yes, of the Night Spins. Yeah, the, the yeah. rock star awesome, drummer awesome of the band. Night Spins. Yeah, definitely go check out that band. <laughs> <laughs> and there, I can just see them exploding. They're they're already kind of like uh, getting more popular too, um, but. Uh, I, as the simpletons were kind of, we, we were going different ways just of our different priorities. And I was finding that I really wanted to keep exploring, um, the clown because that starting from the simpletons and the simpletons was created specifically just because of what we had learned in, in school, um, from the red nose, um, we took that, went with it, created this this clown group, and then as they were going separate ways, I really w- fell in love with with the clown, and so I wanted to keep doing it. Um, and at that time, I was reading the book um, "The Artist's Way," uh, but I think it's Julia Campbell, um, and that was really. I was so thankful that that book was, I was reading that book at the time because what it did is it helped push me to keep doing the clown. And the first thing that came up was the question of, you know, she narrowed it down to, if you could do anything right now, what would you do? And the first thing that came up was like, I could street perform. I could just go on the streets. That's free. And just literally go out there. So that's what ended up happening is I, I was street performing in Washington square park, just going out there constantly by by myself. Yeah. And this Um, was following the simpletons, which if people don't have any context of that, that was a kind of live street performance immersive. mm -hmm. You guys were like on the subway, you're in the streets of New York and parks. So you're kind of, you know, Andrew maybe is floating towards some producing and some directing and some uh, music, obviously, to where he mm-hmm. is now. Ian is kind of going in what direction post Simpletons? Yeah, he's. Um, I, I mean, do some man, Shakespeare. You, you, should, if have, I you should even have even on the or Ian on the podcast. Andrew's scheduled. Ian's. I'm going to talk to him. So th- yeah. those are both going to happen. But solid. Yeah, he's. Um, he went into more of um, creating like a school. Um, that's the process he's happening right now. He's a part of a dance center with his wife, Sarah, and they are also um, alum. 
yeah, Sarah's alum too. And so they're creating a beautiful space out there in White Plains um, just for, for um, kids called City Center Dance. Uh, and so... Andrew's drumming. Andrew's Ian's drumming. teaching. Ian's You're like, teaching. I'm fucking he with the clown. He teaches like keto, yeah. And then I'm, right. I'm over here doing, doing the clown thing. And um, I moved out of New York... And I'll, I'll get just get a, like a, a brief, like a rough summary moved out of New York, uh, ended up doing a touring or a touring show show that I created in Central America, um, created a GoFundMe. Yeah. I don't know if I even talked to you about this, but created a GoFundMe campaign, um, uh, to raise, uh, it was about $3,000 to perform for kids for free in Central America. It rings and, a bell. It rings yeah. a bell. And I started off in Belize, went in Guatemala, Nicaragua, and then ended up in Costa Rica at the very end and just performed for like NGOs and, um, and, and like impoverished areas where NGOs uh, means what is that? A non governmental organization. Um, and it's literally just like a space to help. Um, it's like a, kind of like a nonprofit way of just giving money to pe- kids that, that have, do not have that, um, and education and things like that. Um, so I was performing that. I did that for about three months, then moved, um, back into North Carolina. And then Ian contacted me cause he, at the time he wasn't in city center dance, but he was a part of a puppet show um, uh, led by this gentleman, Jim West, who created this puppet show for kids, um, based off of Aesop's fables and Ian, I literally was about to go move to LA that I didn't know what I was going to do, but the only thing that was pulling me was to go to LA. Um, and I was still fully pursuing clown and just kept kept going, reading and ruminating. And then before I was about to make the move, Ian rang me up and uh, Jim West had a heart attack and he could no longer perform in the show. And Ian was like, dude, you're the first person I thought of. What are you, what are you doing? And I just said, I'm moving to LA. And he's like, please reconsider, come out to New York. Let's talk about this. And then i I went to New York just for a couple of days. We talked about it. And then we, we literally had this, our vision opened up of the simpletons and we bringing the simpletons back, but bringing it as a duo and me and Ian were planning on doing this, um, like a possibly taking Jim West's, um, platform that he created uh, semi-capitalizing on the model and using the simpletons and traveling to different schools as a way of doing puppetry and clown and molding those worlds together like a super beautiful idea absolutely And and then as i moved there and through the process of we were creating that ian was also a part um with sarah they were thinking about owning a business in uh, white plains and so there was a lot going on while i was i then started i really wanted to hone in on my craft even more with clown i was just like you know what i'm gonna take this to the next level and the next level was that was two different things i wanted to go to open mics but that didn't even happen until i met this guy named ed malone who's a clown teacher and he trained with, uh, um, Philippe Gaulier who taught, uh, Sasha Barrett Cohen, uh, who, wow. from Borat. and so that is so funny. I was just yeah. telling you the other day how like you, you, you could be like a Borat impersonator on the street. Yeah, you, you, did you could that. be That's like, so you could be like the Times Very Square nice. Borat <laughs> where people show up and they're like, huh, we got Bumblebee from Transformers, Wolverine. <laughs> and is that guy Borat? He's fucking Borat on the street because you have, <laughs> dude, you put yourself in the right, like give yourself the hair and the stash mm. and you're good at the voice. It would be like very yeah. convincing. You also are so good at the physicality and stuff. So yeah, that's so funny I, that you say that. 
I would say uh, never say never, but I don't think that I would ever attempt to impersonate such a um, a beautiful clown such as Sasha Baron Cohen's a uh, character Borat. Yeah, but, I hear that. I, I'm kind like, of tongue in cheek about it, but yeah, if someone yes, was going to do but it, if somebody was to do it, if it if he I. dies tomorrow <laughs> and they're like, we need Borat again, they're calling you, dude. They got to <laughs> like, call dude, you. If someone else do? gets that part, I'll hunt him down. <laughs> Yeah, man. I, oh gosh, freaking love Sacha Barry Cohen. Amazing. He, he, yeah. And so, um, uh, Philippe Gaulier, the teacher, actually, there's a couple of, um, I believe there's a couple of NCSA people that have trained with him as well. Um, I'm blanking on his name. I think it's, it starts with a T, Tim or something. Anyway, um, people have trained with him, but, um, it's a very uh, different, it's completely different than Bob Francisconi's uh, way he does clown. Okay, um, let's get so into that. Like, what Bob does that Fran- mean? So Bob Francisconi's style of clown, I would say, is similar to, um, it has similarities to Jacques Lecoq. Yeah, um, yeah for sure. Um, but Bob created his own his own style. And for anybody who's listening, who's not super familiar with that, because Bob's not, is no longer teaching that program. So that's not the same, it's not the same situation there, but for the longest time, and you're welcome to, if you're listening to this, go back and listen to the two greatest episodes of At the Elephants that have ever been recorded. The Um, special sauce there. Jesus Christ. Uh, I talked to Bob for so long that he's the only one who has two episodes that are full length that are just him talking. Um, he started in the late seventies as a guest artist at school, of the arts ended up becoming one of the longest serving staff members in the, and faculty members in the history of the school, uh, was also responsible, um, as the assistant Dean traveling with Robert Besseda for like 20 plus years, uh, chose the drama school students across the country and across the world, uh, for the two decades. Um, so, and we should say too that, of course, the simpletons and your clowning is almost entirely at that point before you met Philippe, based in the Bob Francisconi method, which if you go listen to his episodes, was an amalgam of some training he got from a few different people, mm-hmm. um, his comedy partner. He's a, and as you say, there's some Jacques Lecoq in there. There's some there's some Chaplin influences. There's some different stuff going on, but it was the Sconey method. Like he mm-hmm. really created his own thing. And, and I asked him, I think in that interview, so where did you come up with this go? He's like, I made it up. I, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, so that's really, a, but you know, the drama school knows this and, but the, even the current drama students that might be, that might hear this are not going to know maybe the full extent. So that's, that's who we're talking about. And that's a hundred percent of your clowning background before you yeah. start experimenting. Exactly. Right? So go on. Philippe um, is different in what way? Uh, Philippe is, um, how would I put it? Uh, it's almost like anarchy, uh, like beautiful anarchy. Um, it's uh, basically the way Philippe Gaulier teaches. And it's, I mean, Ed cre- um, uh, was inspired by his teaching, created his own style, but has a lot of that. Um, it's almost like, so he almost puts on this role uh, like it's a teacher role but it's it's um it's almost like a character in itself the teacher it's uh this is just the first thing that's coming to me and it may be a bad analogy but like somebody that's like throwing rocks at you as you're as you're as you're up there it's like and a lot of stand-up comedians love to and there's a bunch of stand-up comedians that have come out of Philippe Gaulier that love his style because it's like a a heckler that's just like <clears throat> throwing shit, throwing stuff at you. Constantly. Thinking of the scene in Dodgeball where Rip Torn's like flinging <laughs> wrenches yeah. at him you and can shit. Dodge a wrench, you can dodge yeah, a ball. <laughs> exactly. It's like you're not going to get any better yeah. training than literally dodging. Fucking. Yeah. And I get so, that. I can see the value in that. Just hearing so it put he that way. Has this, his voice is, is very gravelly, and he talks like this, and he and he is just uh, insulting you whole time, and like you know, uh, like he's just constantly insulting you. And then if you do yeah. something good, it's 
um, he'll be like, oh, you were beautiful. And that's like, it's just simple things like, oh, we, we can dream. We can dream around this uh, uh, is those kind of comments. And given I have never taken, I, I've just watched a lot of recordings, heard his voice, like, and I understand from Ed, just of all the stories he's told me that that's the way he, um, he literally teaches in a way it's just games. It's just games constantly. You're, you're getting up in this space. He'll create a scenario. It's like, you're a cook that's cooking a meal for the president of the United States. And you also have to get across the um, you're also trying to sneak across the border while you're while you're doing that. And he's very improv, three, very like classic giving, improv. Yeah, it's like he's giving you three scenarios that are are meant for you to fail. There's no possible way you can do those all at once, but it's meant as an exercise of like, can you make the audience laugh? And uh, that's really, that's it's simply put, that's really what the clown is all about is it's about um, entertaining the audience in any way possible. Um, and keeping do you think there's it, anything yeah. in, in it like about distracting your mind in a way? To where it's like, you know what I mean? Like you have so many things going at once that you yeah. can't over focus on just one. I mean, like, how do I it. make the meal funny? Because you don't even have time for that because you're also yeah. like, I got to get across the border and I got to be, you know, carrying a cougar on my back or whatever the third thing I, is. Like, yeah, it, it, it feels like there's a distraction element almost built into it. Absolutely. And I, um, I'm going to butcher this quote, but it's like, he says something like a clever comedian is a, is a dull comedian. Um, mm. You know, it's the, when any time that a comedian is trying to be clever, um, it's just going to fall flat. Um, and people can, clever comedians can get laughs, but you can tell between a full belly laugh and like, a, like, ah, I got it. <laughs> That's funny. Um, yeah, I get a lot know? of those when I And work. it's just like, what he's teaching is, um, spirit he's teaching yeah. he's teaching the inner child um he's teaching what what kids naturally do already is they have no inhibitions and they don't think about like how how stupid they look right um because stupid is actually the genius the genius of um stupidity is the genius of the clown Dickie Ellis used to say when he would come to town to do his little master classes and work with the high school classes, I love this. He would say, in my business, stupid is a compliment. So if I yeah. tell you what you just did was stupid, you nailed it. Nailed it. <laughs> and then he would be like, he would like laugh and he would go, now that's yes. stupid. And I love that. I loved that. Beautiful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like, uh, yeah, you were a beautiful idiot. Uh, that's, uh, that's another way of putting it. Yeah. I yeah, love that for sure. So, much. so yeah. you're, you're working with Ed and then what, what happens from there as far as you getting on stage and yeah, you actually so, sharing that work with people? Absolutely. So through, um, being inspired by that, that method, um, and Ed's teachings, I was just like, what the hell? Like, this is completely different. Um, but at, at the same time, it's the same, um, and what I was discovering is like, this was the next step of my evolution of clown is removing the red nose that I had started with Bob. And Bob has always said, you don't need the red nose. It's just the latex nose and string. A, it's a tool. It's, yeah. yeah. And so um, the next evolution of the clown for me was getting rid of the red nose because really the clown is for the people. The clown is for the people, and it's also the, the clown is the, the 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 wrench in the system. And so I was realizing that if oh man, I'm getting chills just saying this out loud. If I'm gonna be committing myself to doing this full time and doing this for for the world, I have to be able to do different facets of clown and to and I really wanted to step into the space of, of, of open mics and being on the stage of where um, uh, stand-up comics uh, are and be like, hmm, if I can step in the space and they don't know what I'm doing, that's a beautiful thing. 
And of course I get inspired by like Andy Kaufman and Jim Carrey and um, cause they, they were all in the stand-up scene. Um, but they Kaufman do, more than Jim Carrey Kaufman was more than playing Jim Carrey, the game yeah. that you're playing. Yeah, which exactly. Is, Jim Carrey was doing, act, I don't actually belong here because of mm, the kind of comedy I'm doing. At least that's what they'll tell me. Mm-hmm. But I'm here to make people laugh, and that's what the fuck we're doing. And making people laugh is making people laugh, that's no matter how point. it goes. And I, I, you know, I'm a Kaufman like mega fan. I, I, I try to digest everything of his and and watch everything. And and you're absolutely right because people hold him up a lot uh, without really getting into what it was that made him so different. And it, you're exactly right. He was doing a type of clowning, which we're going to get into that word in a minute because that came yeah. up in our big long talk about how that word hits people's ears. Yes, and exactly. He was really doing more of a a chaplain, more of a uh, you know subverting people's expectations because you go into a comedy club, you go into an open mic for stand up, and I mean if you just if you just have a prop. If you just have a guitar, if you just have one thing that makes it look like you're not going to get up and be like, airport food is blah, blah, blah. Like if you, if you have anything that's not traditional standup, you're half the room is rolling their eyes, checking their phone. They've checked mm. out because they're like, this is going to be weird. They're just going to try yeah. to fuck with me. And I don't, I'm, this is going to be something I'm not bizarre. comfortable with this. Yeah. Well, yeah, which, yeah. Which, of course, for you at this point, after all your heckling and especially after your school training, fuck your comfortability. That's not what yeah. I'm here for. Yeah. I, I'm I'm comfortable when you're uncomfortable because I know that <laughs> I'm pushing something. Mm, and and Andy loved that. Documented. I'm not saying for him. He's he loved it when the audience was like, and what the fuck is this and see this is where i like this is opens up a little bit of where i think that some of what andy kaufman does does is not clown what andy kaufman does is actually what he created out of just like like his spirit but with when you say that about the uncomfortability is something that i had learned from ed malone um and philippe goley talks about is I'm not looking for the audience to be uncomfortable. If Mm. the audience is actually uncomfortable, I'm, I'm, I'm pushing them away. What I'm looking to do is all it's, I like to call it magic. It's literally like I am getting them on the same page. We're all at, but, but at, for me, it's very Zen. It's like for me to be on the, for them to be on the same page with me, I have to be on the same page with them. Mm. And this is a lot of what stand up comics do is it's like they read the room before they're getting up on the stage. They're like, okay, looks like this crowd's a little bit this way. I'm going to shift my set a little bit. Cause, right. And cause that's there. A good stand up comedian is going to find a way to make the audience laugh no matter what. Um, I mean, well, they still kind of stick to their thing, but, but, uh, yeah, I feel with Andy Kaufman, the one thing I noticed is sometimes he, like half the time he didn't even care if people were laughing or not. He was just no, like, absolutely. He, he wanted just to like, elicit a reaction gonna, from it them. It was like, uh, I think there was a word Dadaism. It's uh, mm, like yeah. based in the world of the absurd. It's like, you're going to be uncomfortable and I don't even care. I'll like read a whole book of Nietzsche and you like, and you're going to like it. My favorite thing that he used to do is he would he would get up and he would start reading like a tale of two cities. Just yeah, reading the said. book. Right. That's what I would yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. And then I think that's even in the, the movie, like, the Jim Carrey movie, uh Man on and the that's Moon. That's hilarious to me. And then they would yell, they would yell at him like, fuck you, do the thing we saw on TV. And right. the fact that they had a demand of him was what he didn't like. And that's why he did what he did. Mm. It was like, don't tell me what my act is supposed to be. And the more you push me or or more you pull me towards what you want me to do, I'm not a monkey and you give me an order and I do what you told me to do. Yeah. And as yeah. soon as you do, that rebellious thing in me says, fuck you, I'm not doing that. So he would read like Great Expectations or Tell of Two Cities and then they would scream at him 
do the thing on taxi, right? Do the foreign man, do that. We want to see that. That's what we paid for. Yeah. And then he would be like, all right, I tell you what, I'll give you a choice. I'm either going to keep reading the book or I'll just play a record for you and I'll sit here and you can listen to the record. And they start screaming for the record. They're like, just give us the record. Fine, we'll listen to music. And he goes and puts on the record and it's a recording of him reading Tale of Two Cities. Picking up from exactly where he left off. Probably the genius thing I've ever heard. And he would walk half the audience more. They would leave. I love it. And he would just be like, this is what it is. Tell me what to do again. I already have your money. What are you going to do? You're going to do nothing. And I, I appreciate Nothing. that. And I also yeah. appreciate that attitude. Another uh, quick like tangent on that is Norm Macdonald, rest in peace. Yeah. Norm yeah. Macdonald used to famously, and this is one of my favorite things about him, mm-hmm. on SNL when he was doing Weekend Update, he would write a joke with his writer. And there was a pretty mm-hmm. consistent rule with Saturday Night Live. And as I understand, it's still true. If something bombs at dress rehearsal, on Friday, full dress rehearsal. If it bombs, a joke doesn't work in a sketch on weekend update, whatever. Mm-hmm. If it bombs on Friday, it will bomb on Saturday a hundred percent. It like is the same environment. The crowd is not that different. You are going to get a bomb on Friday, will bomb on Saturday. And he was one of the only weekend update writers. He would write something with his partner, his writing partner for it. He would do it on Friday. They loved the joke. They would tell it on Mm -hmm. Friday. It would eat shit. And then Mm -hmm. he'd do it again on Saturday. Because he was like, I I like this joke. I believe this joke is funny. And it's, it's interesting because you get split opinions on this. Some people are like, well, if the whole audience is telling you it's not funny, then it isn't. But he's like, but it is. I know it is. And I don't care. And he would sit in the bomb and just stare down the barrel of the lens after delivering a joke he knew was going to eat shit. It would eat shit. And he would go, yeah. See, in other news, mm, you know, he didn't care. Yeah, this is, uh, and and this is beautiful, like what this is unlocking in the conversation because like um, uh, the whole thing about like that is what, is similar to like Charlie, like this may sound weird, but similar to Charlie Chaplin because Charlie Chaplin was doing something that was like, he did not care um, how it was going to be received because he believed in his heart that it was, it was his truth. And same thing with Norm Macdonald. It's like, he didn't care if, if they, if people were like, this sucks because he knows in his heart, it doesn't. He knows that it's true. And so that it's, it's this, oh man, it's like a, it literally is a Zen like place where it's like, you have to come in there, not caring at all what people think of you, but at the same time, you have to be in your heart and you have to be sensitive. Like, and I'm not saying sensitive in your material, um, like what comes out of your mouth. I'm saying sensitive of the energy of what have how you're delivering because in comedy to get someone to laugh i and i'd love to hear your opinion i think that it has less to do with the words that is coming out of the comedian's mouth it has to do with the delivery and this is just goes right to right to Gerald Friedman it's all yeah. about the action Yeah. I mean, I agree with that a hundred percent. Um, I would say, because here's how I know proof of that just to, instead of just spouting my bullshit opinion, which is whatever it is, but here's my proof (laughs) of how that's definitely true. I am, and this is my skill set as a comedic person. I am good at the words. I'm a pun guy. I love a good, what they call now dad jokes. I love being like, I just posted a stupid old joke today on like Instagram, joke, yeah. the emerging sea thing. So it's yes. like climate change isn't an, a national emergency, which is weird because it's a literal emerging sea. Bombed. Mm. And I totally went Norm MacDonald on it because we did the joke before. People didn't really like it. And I was like, I'm ending the monologue with it. And I don't care if it works or not. It bombed on the show that we were doing yes. it on. And then I told the audience... This is for me. I don't even care. <laughs> I wanted to say that in front of people for a reason I can't explain to you because yes. I'm tickled by like, ah, those two words sound the same. 
That didn't do it for you. That's fine. I delivered the joke in the clip correctly, right? Yes. I don't think there's another way I could have done that joke that would have sold it better. And the words are technically a good funny pun. Oh, wow. Those two things play on the words. It's not enough. It's not enough to just have a good pun. It's not enough to be clever, like you said, with the words. The Mm -hmm. audience is like, I got it. They sound the same. Who fucking cares? (laughs) (laughs) It it didn't get me. (laughs) And it really does go to the point of like people talk about, you know, uh, Dane Cook or even like Gallagher, someone who's very physical. Mm -hmm. And they're like, they're not funny. They're not funny. It's like, well, they're selling out theaters and stadiums. (laughs) Why do you think that is? Maybe it is just the delivery. Maybe the thing he said, if you wrote it down on paper and read it, you'd be like, what's funny about that? Yeah. But he said it while going like this and doing a whole, <laughs> and, <laughs> yeah, and just like, Bleh. like that was enough for the whole crowd of 5,000 people to be like, ah, me too, I get it. And one of the things that I think is so crucial with stand up and i think this is different than what you do but in stand up mm-hmm. when you're working more with the words than you are with the energy in the room or silence or mm-hmm. moments with the audience things that you're playing around with a lot more in stand up where it's more dialogue based it is so much more about painting a visual picture that puts an image in the audience's mind but right right before the punchline they want mm. you to say the thing And what's even better, if you say the thing that they wanted you to say, you get this. If you get really close to the thing that they wanted to hear, but you left turn it and make it different and maybe a little better and funnier, Mm. that's when they lose their shit. And people are like, that's fucking funny. Because I wanted him so badly to say Kurt Cobain. And then he said Dave Grohl or whatever the thing. And I was like, ah, it's even fucking better. I still do that as someone who's been consuming comedy since I was a fucking fetus. I've <laughs> always been obsessed with it. And I still, I get ahead of, I watch stand up all the time, professional comedians, great comedians. And halfway through the joke, I'm like, this is the punchline. And then, but, but, then there it goes. I already know it's coming. And because and I've, I've heard, <laughs> I've listened to Gerald. I've listened to Bob. I've listened to how jokes literally are put together, how they work as jokes. And so I get ahead of it. When that gets subverted, when I already have the mental image in my mind, that can be really powerful. That yeah. can be like, ah, that's not what I thought he was going to say. It's it's very, very hard to get in there because you're right. It's both things, right? You have the comics who are like Norm MacDonald who are like, and this is the thing I think is important to say, and then what mm. we're learning about you and I and talking about this, what we learned on our long conversation, comedy and comedians, it's not a monolith. There's not a one size fits all. There's a lot of different ways to do it. That's why I don't like yeah. to tell people, especially when I was oh, I owned a club and was running a club, that's not comedy. That's not funny. I don't say shit like that because I don't mm. I don't know what works for everybody else. I've watched people kill and I'm stone faced. I'm like I don't get this is not work for yeah. me. Yeah. And there are the comics who are reading the room, adjusting their set as it goes. They're like, this isn't really working. I'm going to go ahead and wrap this bit up. I got another five, 10 minutes of it, but there is this whole subject matter is not hitting. So I'm going to leave and move on to something I think might do better. Then you have the Norm McDonald's who are like, well, this is what I wrote down. You know, I'm going to do this joke that I wrote. <laughs> it's a good Norm McDonald impression. Thanks, man. You know, it's that uh, whatever, you know, OJ shot his wife. That's what happened. Uh, and so, yeah, it's a, uh, it's it's not the same for everybody and that's what i loved about talking with you the other day and let's let's so let's get into that a little bit you started well, quick, doing the mics i had a quick question and i yeah, was really ahead, curious ahead. but i like held up um when you told that joke about the emerging c yeah and it bombed and then you said that nah, jokes for me did they laugh on that part a little bit yeah. A little bit. I've always I'm, a, kn- I'm big about the recovery. A lot of comics yeah. don't do that, but I like to do the you know what? Fine. Like I, yeah, I like to like, comment on the fact or like, that it didn't fuck work. You, that was for me. Uh, yeah. I've always yeah. noticed, I've always noticed, and th- this is a- always a, a good sign a, a, a sign of a comedian that listens, that's good with talking and listening, is when they tell a, a joke that bombed, 
they're like, they'll say something like, oh, I fucking bombed. And it always gets a laugh. It always gets a laugh because it's, because it's in a sense like, yeah, they did that joke, but they are still honest in the moment of like, yeah, that was a fucking bomb. And I've, I've always, that's always my favorite part when I get to watch comedians do that and they're aware and they, and they do that. And I'm like, I, I I'm always the one that laughs too. Um, cause there's so Eddie is our, does some of my favorites of those. He, yeah. he does a thing and I was, you know, I don't, he hasn't done as much comedy lately, but in his, in his heyday of really pumping out specials, he used to do this fake bit where he would have a pantomime pen and pad and write a note on his hand. Uh-huh. And so he would like do a joke and he'd be like, all right, here's that in this. And then Queen yeah. Elizabeth's like, no, I was like, and then he would do the thing. And then he would be like, Never tell that joke again. <laughs> yeah. They hate you. They're not going to buy tickets to your oh, next show brilliant. if you say that shit. And it, so that I can I tell love. you've watched a lot of Eddie Izzard just by your impersonation. It's like spot on. I'm just I'm a big fan of of trying to figure out people's vocal patterns too. I'm kind of a, yeah. That's yeah, a thing yeah. that I, my wife said that one time. She's like, "Why don't you do more impressions? Like as a comic, <laughs> like why don't you?" And I was like, "Because you have to." Back in the 80s and 90s, when it wasn't as hacked to do that, you could get up and you could be like, this is um, Robin Williams at the grocery store and then do that. And if it was pretty good, people would be like, that is Robin Williams at the grocery store. Now you're like, you guys want to hear Bill Burr at the mechanic? And people are like, no. You know why? Because Bill Burr is still a comedian and we can just go watch him do what he does. Uh, but I, but but I, I would you, say, like in a in a in a very crafty way, you can do it without doing that. Like you can, you have to thing. work it in. Yeah. You have to be like, it's like, it's like that, or it's like Bill Burr when you're like, you know, go into. Or it. even better is if, and this is what I mean by painting a picture. A great yes. way to get an impression into your set is to, in just do it like somehow organically into what yeah, you're doing. Yeah. Like if I'm talking about something, I'm like, oh yeah, it's, it's brutal, and I'm like. Bill Burr get in here all of a sudden <laughs> after Brilliant. you can comment on it yes. after and almost like I didn't that's mean beautiful. to I just kind of that's it's like, like one way but itself. yeah again I'm not doing stand up as much so I don't get to play around with this lately but yeah um yeah man so okay back to you this show's yeah, yeah, about yeah. goddamn so, you <laughs> I I I I got off track here yeah what no it's okay you? it's my fault I'm the tangential <laughs> host over here um but yeah so let's let's talk about you taking the work that you're doing. And you're yes. taking it on stage. How? What were your first responses to trying to do what we call clowning at a stand-up comedy open mic? How did that go? First responses, um, honestly, and this is where it was like imposter syndrome stepped in because every time I would get up, I everybody was laughing. Like, oh yeah, yeah. Every time. Awesome. And, 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 and so and that not- was one of those things from like, oh, I should be bombing right now. Like, and, and that was the thing. It's like imposter syndrome. It was like, you should be bombing right now. Like this is, and given when I'm. Because you're before, just starting or because you feel no, and ignorant it, this has to every, it or. This has everything to do with Ed Malone's class. Literally you're constantly bombing in that class because it's just, you're getting up in the space and he'll like p- part of like an exercise. He'll be like, okay, make us laugh. And he'll just, just make us laugh. And that's it. Your and first that's singing like, class. That's Sing the exercise. Song? It's like putting yourself in a, in a fucking fire cooker or, or whatever, or pressure, cooker. whatever pressure cooker. Yeah. And, and, he'll do that and gosh i see so many stand-up comedians that i've that come in like i I, there's a bunch of amazing stand-up comedians in new york and i watch them come in in the class and they they do their material and they bomb um but then they just like he's like i don't want to hear your material i just want you to i just want you to do something funny make us laugh and they bomb every time i mean not every time not every time there's some, some, some people that I've seen that they're like, they're very sensitive and they can get that, but like, yeah. And so I did that so much and I got, and where used... are you doing your first mics? Like geographically, like, where are they? Uh, uh, in New York. Uh, so New I York. was in Brooklyn and I was in Brooklyn living in Bushwick at the time. And so I was doing it in Bushwick. I would go into, um, I would go into East village. I can't remember the name of the so you're place. doing comedy 
in the in one of the comedy capitals, there are other comedians mm. going up who are like fucking good. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Um, As opposed now, to doing them, no it, offense. In I never Arkansas. did make it to the comedy cellar. Um, I I just sure. was not doing it long enough to get in that space. But sure. Um, but yeah, I yeah, I was doing I was doing them at um just like comedy open mics. Um, it's just a some, very different environment. Is why I point that out than like. Yeah doing it in Fayetteville, Arkansas at a place where people, frankly, cause I've done a lot of middle of America open mics when I was traveling, uh, for work and stuff, I would like work in an open mic while I was there to shoot TV shows and stuff. And yeah. they're a little bit more like, okay, well, this is fun comedy. Okay. Let's watch oh. some comedy. I'm already here at the bar, oh the coffee shop. Maybe it's a mixed mic and a guy just played Wonderwall and I'm like, all right, tell some jokes. New York City, <laughs> LA, you know, these are different places to be doing comedy. There are legitimately talented comedians who just haven't popped yet that are going up right after you. There might even yeah. be a heavy hitter who's yeah. just like, fuck it, I'll go to an open mic tonight and drop it in and you could end up having like Mike Berbiglia go up after you. It happens in these Yeah, cities. yeah. This that very never different. happened, but yeah, I I definitely see, uh, seen a Ziz Ansari just like show up at a random um at a random bar that had a Joey stage Diaz in the back. used to come to my favorite mic like twice a week so back cool. when I was doing it. I, Mike Lawrence went up after me uh once at a at an open mic at oh, I can't remember what somewhere in Hollywood and yeah. it's like what the f I thought we were amateurs. <laughs> what is this? Um, I'm gonna uh take a quick piss and I'll be right yeah, back. Yeah, that's fine. Have a break. Sweet. Love the necklace, bro. All right, now this is my favorite part of the interview where he can't hear us and we get to dissect his space a little bit. Okay, we've got some woodwork. This is good. I like this. The plant is nice. This is very good framing. I want to give him credit for the framing. We have like a very movement oriented collage over here. That's nice. Not an HD image, so I can't make out the titles on the books. That's usually one of my favorite things to tear apart. I love the crystal lamp is cute with what looks like an army man in front of it, though I know that's not what it is. One of these um I believe that's an Irish hand drum, though I'm not an expert. Uh, what else have we got over here? I love the wood. I love the wood paneling on the wall, the kind of like this part of the fence fell down. So let's put it up on the wall. Pretty good set, if I'm being honest. Ooh, Pretty wee. solid. That was a good one. Nice, man. I'm proud of you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You don't worry about your ability to perform. Um, so, <laughs> Buzzing. Goo -goo. Um, okay. So you start doing this clowning stuff at open yeah. mic, comedy open mics in New York. You're doing yeah. well. The crowds and doing, are enjoying doing well. it at first. And I, I, I honestly, I, I have to give um, a lot of credit to doing that class, um, clown class, because I was constantly like putting in a space of like, of just putting in the fire and that. So when I went into open mics and I was like doing the stuff, the way that Ed teaches is he puts you in that space and he's really like, he does not let you buy. Um, so when I would get in the space in open mics, I was like, actually like people were really loving it. So I was like, Oh, that's the genius of what he's doing is it's literally like, it's, it's really stretching you. Um, now given I, I have, I have bombed, um, plenty of times, but like, I was just noticing that that imposter syndrome was showing up a lot just because it was like, I was doing well. Um, and so I noticed too, a lot of, um, and this is just this is just because of what I do. Um, a lot of uh, comics would would get up right after me, and it would be their perfect opportunity to make fun of me. Of and course, I because love, you weren't following the rules. Yeah, exactly. And I love it because, um, like, <laughs> most of the time, it would be well. I, I wouldn't say a hundred percent of the time, but uh, most of the time, they would 
make fun of me and I would be the one just like cackling and then like nobody else is laughing. It's a fucking <laughs> total red herring thing to do. I learned that grinding comedy in LA. You think you're going to get a whole set out of talking shit about the last guy. If you're listening and you're thinking about comedy, don't do it. Here's what, here's the thing. You get one line, you get one joke and you know what? The host of the mic, if they're good, is going to get it first anyway. And then when you come up, you don't get to join the club of talking shit. And I don't care if the guy was weird or just he ate shit or maybe he was telling a bunch of rape jokes that everyone hated. The host will get up and be like, that's why we call them open mics, folks. All right, moving on. That's it. Yeah, That's the only line. And that you'll get a chuckle out of that. Everyone will be like, yep, that's how we were feeling. Glad that's over. Give us something new. Let us move mm-hmm. past that. Even if we liked it, new guy. Yeah. And if the new guy gets up and the new guy's like, ooh, really got a little weird back there, didn't it? You think you can just get, and he starts doing a bit about yeah. the guy who was before, the girl was before, who you either didn't like or was weird or broke the rules. You're yeah. done. They're never going to fucking like it. And I wish more people would just give that up. It's it's a bit of- Tell like your ins- jokes. Yeah, it's a bit of insincerity, honestly. It's like- um, or As a host, I yes, I used to scream from the back of the room sometimes when I host because I, I hosted a lot of open mics. Yeah, I would be like, write a joke. I would be like, <laughs> what are you doing? We're Brilliant. here to do jokes. Write a joke. Yes. And what you're doing wouldn't have bothered me because I went to theater school and I have a lot of patience yeah, yeah. for challenging the form. But people who yeah. yeah are like, let's make the whole thing about talking shit or about the host. That's the dumbest thing you can do. Let me get up and be mean to the guy who's hosting the night. Even yeah. if they don't like him, you're going to eat was, shit. Um, um, and, and like not to get too off on, on track, but this is still the same on the same subject, but um, I had an open mic that I did uh, uh, recently where my idea coming into the space, it was like, I want to see if I can um, um, be born on stage what that means don't know but i was i was going to be like let's see if i can do this um this is the challenge and i ended up actually having a woman come on stage and i like puppeted her arms to like have a birth um and it was based there was there was like music and all this stuff and People were laughing at the beginning. And then there was this like, I could, I could sense the uncomfortability of like the audience. And that was my edge. So I was like, okay, people are uncomfortable. I've just got to work on it, keep pushing through and see if I can like bring it in. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, literally. And there was a moment where I go underneath, like she's standing and I pop like a leapfrog. I I prop my head out from, from underneath her legs. And, and then I pretend like I'm being birthed in slow motion, like popping through the air. And it's so fucking weird, man. It's it's so weird and hilarious. And I love it. Um, and there were, mind you, there were still people laughing, but you could feel the tension. You can feel a little bit of tension. I was looking at mostly women. I was looking at women's eyes and they were like, you could sell some of them were a little uncomfortable. Some do of them their were like, face, What's do the face on? of the people watching. So the you. one woman that I saw that, that I was looking at, she was like, she was like, yeah, get me out this, of here. Like a little, a little pullback. Um, some people were like leaning in, which is always a good sign. Cause they're just like, what the hell? I love this. So, and some people were just like, what is going on? They were like in the yeah. middle ground where it's like, what is going on? And long story short, after that set, I'm like, I'm my own worst critic, but I'm getting better at just being my best cheerleader. Um, Cause I think that's really important for, for any performer, any, any comedian in general is like, it's, 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 it's tough what you're doing. And so like, when I leave the space, I have to make sure I'm always like writing in my journal and just like congratulating myself for doing something that's challenging. And then it was like, Two days later, I get a Facebook message from the friend of the woman that I pulled on stage. Um, and he honestly, he he handled it in a, in a beautiful way. And he had said, um, hey, I, you know, 
in so many ways, he was just like, what you were doing a lot of, I feel I was uncomfortable and my friend was very uncomfortable. Um, and, uh, he's like, I know you, I, I normally, I like your stuff and like, I think you're funny. And cause I brought him up on stage one time too. And he's like, I really enjoy it. But I, I feel. Did you know said, these people? No. Okay. He found they just me on caught, Facebook. Okay. Got yeah. It, he, got it. he found me on Facebook and, and, uh, and he was like, I just, I feel like a lot of people were uncomfortable and comedians ended up making fun of me because I just left like right after. And that's normally what I do. I like to like leave. Um, uh, sometimes I'll stay, but for the most part I leave. And I remember as I was walking out, one of the comedians was like, Hey man, I'm going to, I'm going to like make fun of you. Is that cool? And I was like, yeah, whatever. Really, like, I don't care. And I left. Nice and enough. what ended up happening is, um, uh, they were making fun of me and they were saying like, yeah, pe the people started getting more uncomfortable when you were getting made fun of. And like, and I was just like, this is great. Like, I love this. And um, what was his kind of end but, game? But with his, that? He his, just, his, his, his old MO, his old MO was just like, I don't want you to put it on, on Instagram. Cause I had filmed it. He's like, I don't want it to be put on Instagram. And I was like, yeah, I respect that a hundred percent. So I just, I, you know, it's in my archives or whatever. But when I came back, I asked the comedian, I was like, so how did it go? Like, how did your joke go? And he was like, ah, nah, it didn't really go over well. And somebody else tried to do make fun of you too. And it just did not go over well. And I was like, hmm, it doesn't, <laughs> it just doesn't, even if it's weird, because the yeah. truth is, is if it's bad, the audience wants to move on. They don't want you to yeah. remind them about it. They just give them something else to think about. Cause I don't think about yeah. that anymore. Um, and if it was really good, you're, you're showing, even if it was weird or whatever, yeah. but you decided to make fun of it, but it, people laughed and they liked it. Well, now you're just showing them that you've got nothing better than they'd had, you know, like mm -hmm. you're just, mm -hmm. you're being like, Hey man, the best I can do is comment on the good thing we saw. Yeah. It's uh, like an, and, and it's an honor. Honestly, it's an honor as well to have comedians do that. It's like, oh, cool. Yeah, for sure. Um, I've, I've, I used to open with, uh, a bit that wasn't, it didn't always do well, but it was fun for me and it gave me material, which is, mm -hmm. I would say a lot of comedians start their set with, I know what you're thinking. I look like if this person and that person had a baby or whatever, mm -hmm. or when did this mm -hmm. person become a whatever. And based on their resemblance to like a celebrity or a cartoon or whatever. And I would say like a lot of comics have that. I don't have one of those because I kind of look like every white dude who's ever been a white dude. And I don't know who I look like. So why don't you guys tell me what I look like? Shout it out. Like you look like blah, blah, blah. Or you, and I would do like what I called the Rob roast. And I would just like, everyone just talk shit or say something mean about me. I'm cool. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm a white dude in America. You can't really hurt me that badly. I'm going to be fine. <laughs> Everything's been working out pretty good. Uh, really yeah. And so, and I got a lot of fun. My favorite thing I ever got was, um, cause I used to wear a suit pretty consistently mm -hmm. when I did stand up, and, um, he would say, I would get a lot. You look like you're the lead in the gay porn version of Jerry Maguire. <laughs> <laughs> I ended up working that. Yeah, that I, used, <laughs> I used that when he was, uh, Eric Rocha gave me that. He's actually one of my favorite okay. comics. Um, uh, and Brilliant. I, I used it for years, I would be like, if I didn't want to do the Rob so I'd be like, a lot of guys have this, but I don't have a joke like that. Well, I guess one time someone did say this and I would use a few of them. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that's, that's always a good time. And, uh, okay. Okay. So we're talking about yeah. your stuff in New York. How do you get out of New York after that? Yeah, what, what takes um, you down South and then out West? Yeah. So this like, um, so the whole thing with Ian was, uh, him building that business and right. what I was seeing happen. Um, and it ended up happening is that all his focus went on that business and the simpletons as the first time it happened, simpletons kind of broke apart. And I just, um, I decided like, okay, the, and this was the, this was the illuminating moment for me is it was like, what I was doing at the the open mics was actually um, the 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 sign that I needed is that you travel 
to New York to do something with someone else. And that's what you've been doing since you got out of school is like you, you've been meeting other people to like create your own thing. And I mean, like I was doing some of my own stuff, but I constantly was being a part of these groups. And they and tell then, us the school to do that. Yeah. Yeah. But like when and you get so, out, lean on your classmates and, and you were and just I, doing what you're told. Yeah. And I parse and, and I agree with like community is really important. Um, and I, uh, but the it kept happening where it was just like things would you know move on or or not work out and what i realized is it's like you don't need someone to do what's in your heart jared and what i was discovering Mm. is that the what was in my heart was the clown and it the more i was reaching out for other people to be a part of it, it it was just it would always not work out and i was like okay you do this for you and, and start really focusing on yourself. That was like really the the path that set for like self-love. And I mean, I was already um, in um, like spirituality. And when I say spirituality, it's just like um, getting tapped into love and just like really reading a lot of self-improvement books and self-empowerment and all those things. And so when I, It got to this place when I was in New York and I decided um, it was when COVID hit, I was actually, I moved, I stayed with Ian in White Plains at the time because there was a lot going on in my apartment and um, my roommates were feeling uncomfortable and like, it was all this stuff going on. And I just, and that's a longer story. Like it, it, yeah, it's, um, so I decided, you know what? Tell me about I your don't... friends and what happened so we can throw them under the bus and embarrass them during yeah, this podcast. Yeah, exactly. I, exactly. And I was like, you know what? I feel like I um, I don't feel welcome in my own apartment. And um, Is it the I... nude clowning you were doing? Yeah, the nude in clowning. The living really room? Didn't... It's just like <laughs> when you're wearing a red nose and you're just slinging your penis around. I mean, like. Right. It was like, can you stop giving birth of... to yourself in the yeah. fucking kitchen? <laughs> like, you guys look, check it out. No, uh, we're not going to look. <laughs> we're not going to do that today. <laughs> so I ended up um, staying with Ian, which was a blessing in disguise because that was able for us to. Um, to go deeper with the simpletons, but in a, in a sense, be honest with each other and be like, yo, this, I'm doing my thing and this you're doing your thing. So what I decided is I'm going to move back home to North Carolina, which I love my family. And that's one of the beautiful things. I love for your people. family. Thank you, Rob. I do. And they love you. And they love you. And they I love know you. they're like very supportive. Like Mike and Steve <laughs> yeah. are like Mike, really Mike fucking supportive. Yes. Yeah. Um, and so they welcomed me home with open arms to just figure out what I was going to do next. Um, and I'm grateful to, to actually have a family that, that will do that. And And I'm sure um, your dad's also in particular kind of respect that need for the life reset because they've, they haven't gone through just the streamline, follow the path, do the same thing the whole time. Yeah. Yeah. They they were very understanding of that. My my dad and his partner and and my mom as well. I'm very, very understanding. And my stepfather. So all that being said, I came home and I was just, um, I needed, I needed a bit of a reset, but um, an idea came out of through COVID is, is I really wanted to hone in onto this, like, uh, traveling bus caravan sort of thing, um, uh, performance van, uh, where I'm traveling around the U S and using it as a way to perform outside of the van, like in parks and stuff to, for people that were dealing with, um, uh, that motherfucker just wants to be in the circus. That's all you yeah, want, baby. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's like I had that that circus mindset, bro. And um I respect that, dude. And that's a lost yeah. thing because because of the animal shit, especially. Yeah. The circus is like not a fucking thing anymore. Like yeah, it used but, to be. But in the in a sense, it's like it's it's still alive and well, but it's been shifted in a different way. And like right. what you had shared with me with the comedians on the bus or whatever yeah, the, that, the like, no fuss comedy bus. No fuss uh, comedy bus. Bugs like, Taylor uh, built, took a school bus and converted it into a traveling uh, comedy venue that tours California yeah. and other places. It's 
pretty dope. It's a, it's a, it's a beautiful idea. And it's just a way of like, Hey man, like self creators just making it happen. And so that was where I started. And I, uh, my half uncle, uh, who lives in Rogers, Arkansas, owns an architect company. And I ended up, um, he was looking for builders and I was just like, ah, you know, that's, that's in line with what I'm envisioning. Maybe I can learn how to build, um, at, like flip a van. And so I decided, and that's just the, how I work, how I work it, by intuitive pulls. I'm like, Oh, that's my pull. And I just, I just packed my stuff up, moved. I t- I feel like I, I have a nomad spirit. So it was very, I think easy anyone listening to this would agree with you. It's like, Nah. Yeah. Well, and you know uh, so. what I think a lot of people don't recognize, um, and you probably have thought a lot about this in this journey. Man, a lot of people are the opposite. I remember, and this is one of my go-to stories. My after my first college uh, experience, which was just like a community college in East Texas, I dropped out. I went back to working in the automotive business where my parents worked, and I worked at a shop where the guy who worked in the parts department. Uh, was a Mexican dude who was like twenty, early twenties, and he lived with his mom and his family, big family, and mm. you know planned to get his own place, but wasn't in a hurry. And I was in this. This was before I moved to North Carolina. This is a lot of what pushed me mm. into going to school of the arts. I was working at this place, thinking like, I got to get out of here. I'm in my hometown. I'm not. I just don't feel. I, I feel stunted. I feel like my head is against the ceiling. I'm like, I got to. And break out of this. And I felt it every day. I was like, I can't, I'm, I'm, this money is good. And I guess this would be a reliable track to stay in this job. Everyone in my family does it. It would be so easy to like make a life in this town and make good money at this thing. But I fucking did not want to do that. And I would talk to my buddy in the parts department. I'll be like, man, don't you ever want to, cause I was like 19. I was like, man, don't you ever just want to like get in the fucking car and just and go to a new town and find new shit, new friends, new girls, new boys, new everything, new bars, new movies. Like, let's just get out of here. Something new. Mm-hmm. And he was like, mm-hmm. bro, no. I don't, <laughs> I don't want to do that. He was Absolutely like, why would I not. leave? <laughs> yeah, he was like, why would I leave Austin? And I was like, you don't want to go see the world? And he was like, I mean, I, I got a TV. It's like, yeah. I don't. What do you, well, I don't know. I don't want to go live. It scared the shit out of him. Uh, mm. My brother-in-law is um, so different from my wife. My wife has traveled a lot and she went to San Francisco. She's from LA. She went to San Francisco for college. She moved to mm. New York a few years ago before the pandemic just to fucking try it out and figure it out. We're a good fit. But her brother, and they're only you know like a year apart, is like, No, Southern California. I'm from LA. He went to UC Irvine. He Mm. wants to, he's a real estate guy. So not only is he dedicated to LA, he's like invested in the land and the property. Like he's, Mm. he is, (laughs) he is so quintessentially like California is where I belong. And I didn't, I didn't really click with how much that is a part of who you are. You either have it in you to be curious you know, Jared's curious world, right? You are curious. Mm. You want to know. You're, and I would even go so far as to say, like, I love that title because it's like, it's it, it's also, it's hidden in there. It's like, Jared's curious about the world. Like, he wants to see and go and be in a new place and meet new people and and have that experience where you're the fish out of water or whatever. And dude, that, I'm not going to say that's better or worse than any than the parts guy, but it is different and you got to know that about yourself and embrace whichever one. If you're a hometown boy, you probably know that about you. But if you've got that nomad spirit that you talk about, you got to fucking lean into that. That is not going to go away. I don't think it goes away. I don't think you go on a fucking vacation once and you're like, okay. I think you're like, that was great. Get, fucking need more of that shit. Mm, where where is the new yeah. thing? I want to learn a new language. I want to. I mean, your stuff in Central America. All of that just screams yeah. like you're I, never full of that. Yeah, man. And and I, I remember there's there's this moment recently where and I was. This is a way of me putting that vision out into the world because I see myself um, traveling around the world um, and doing and performing. And uh, I met this woman uh at a gas station i just pulled over the gas station to go to the bathroom and met this woman named zara from bangladesh and i literally was like 
Well, uh, Zara, I actually am traveling around the world performing and I can't wait to like go through Bangladesh and like, and when I just, it just like came out of my mouth. And then when I like thought about it afterwards, like, wow, that's so cool. Cause I was so stoked about, but I just said it because I'm like putting it into the, putting into, into realities, like that's going to happen. Um, and I just, yeah, it is, it is my, it is a part of me for sure. The nomad spirit. I love that, man. And I really respect it. And that's why when you were like, I'm in Arkansas, I wasn't like, are you okay? Because like my family <laughs> is from Arkansas and Oklahoma, East Texas area, like yes, Arkansas, I okay. like I, I've been to Arkansas, which not yeah. a lot of people have been to Arkansas at all. And right. when, and the only thing I know there other than my family, which is still my family, my great uncle runs a like Christian rehab center there. Okay. And I was like, and so I was like, not thinking you're there, but I was like, it's woods. And, and what are you, what are you doing is what I would have said mm. to anybody else who was there. But when you yeah. were like, I'm in Arkansas, I'm like, I bet you're in fucking Topeka next week and Omaha. Yeah. <laughs> and like, you know, it's like, because to yeah. you, especially being from North Carolina, which is a fucking more I travel, that is a slept on place. I fucking love North Carolina so North much. Carolina. Yeah. And being from a place like that and you knowing the value that is in places like that, it doesn't surprise me at all yeah. that you're like, I'll try Arkansas. Well, it, it's very interesting too, because um, the where I'm at in Northwest Arkansas, um, it is, um, it's pretty amazing. Like it just, it's got like Brooklyn vibes, Asheville vibes going really? on and, fe and fe yeah. Yeah, Fayetteville, Rogers, and Bentonville. Those are that a lot of people are talking more about Northwest Arkansas, specifically because of like the blooming and a lot of the money that they're getting is from the uh uh the Waltons, I think, the Walmart um yeah. people from Walmart. And dude, I mean it's it's beautiful out here. Um however, for me as a and and I'll just speak this out loud. And I've already talked to you about this is like, for me as a performer, this is not the, the space for me to grow my There's skills. Limits. And yeah. Yeah. For yeah, sure. But you're going to go to those three open mics. Yeah. Yeah. There's uh, good. it's nomads trail site is the one I go to every Tuesday. Right now I'm bartending over at feed and folly and um, it's a great place. Um, great food. And I love bartending there, but it's like, I, uh, yeah, I will be, I uh, will be moving on. Just as a quick comment, because I don't know if you and I have ever talked about this, and i kind of surprised I didn't ask this earlier because it would have fit earlier yeah. into the conversation, but did you ever, or at what point, did you go, I'm not doing the traditional acting grind of like Crest White Strips commercials or regional theater, uh -huh. like whatever I can get my yeah, hands yeah. on, I just want to work as an actor. You've really you've been like, I'll, I'll bartend or do construction or whatever while I figure out what the fuck this clown life is. Cause that seems yeah. to be what you've become so dedicated to. Was there a time when you were in New York, like hustling up the regular, what everybody else seems to be doing. And then you were like, fuck that. Did it melt away? Or yeah. did you just never do that? And always were like, nah, clowning. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and before we go ahead, I, I just wanted to check in how does the audio sound in your earbuds? It's just as far, it sounds good for some reason on my end. And I guess it's just a connection issue is like your um, voice is like clippy. Um, oh, that's good to know. Yeah. I'll make sure I'll check that on my end. And I'm, I'm assuming it's because it's recording on your, on your end, it's catching all like what you're receiving right now. So yeah, I'm hoping so. Yeah. Here, I'll make a little note on the time code and I'll I'll check it later. Cool. Your responses are more interesting than my questions. <laughs> uh so I actually when I was in New York, when I moved to New York, literally I got I, I was with a manager um and also so I was with man manager Terra Borgine um from uh diesel management and then I was with uh I was freelancing uh, with a commercial agent, um, uh, uh, Doug Kesson, and was going on commercial auditions, going on um, 
like film and theater auditions with Tara and was doing that. And yeah, I was, I was, um, for lack of a better word, like grinding. Um, and, um, and then it was, I want to say about possibly three years in, uh, um, went through a breakup and went through a lot of like, uh, darker part of my life. Um, as I would call it the dark night of the soul. Uh, damn you're poetic. Yeah. It's, and and, and you'll hear, you can hear that in, in like the sphere of the, like, um, like the, the self-improvement world, like the dark night of the soul is literally those moments of time in your life where it's like, you're, you're uh, basically it's and another word more poetry death and rebirth it's like you're a part of you is dying you're you're getting to know a new part of you and it's like you have to go through that transition and at that point I lost like connection with with the auditioning and all that and I was just like what is going on like I have no desire to go on auditions I have no desire to to be doing any of this and like they're my manager and my agent were were give were were great and it was just I was losing that that energy and then it was and it was like with possibly like seven months into that the simpletons happen. Did you and beat so, yourself up about that at all? Like, because I don't want to oh, go to yeah. the audition, I'm a failure oh, at being an actor oh, and all that. Yeah, man. I beat myself up. So like, gosh, I, I, I was so hard on myself. And I, I remember I actually like call, I was calling my manager Tara and I was like crying over the phone t- telling her, like, I don't know what's going on, but I just like, I can't go to this. I like, I, I don't feel the desire to go to these auditions and I'll go, but it's like, I'm, I'm actually like, and you, and God bless her. She was like, not <laughs> doing the best she could. To, like, listen, I'm not your therapist. Like, you know, yeah, it's, yeah, yeah. Um, right. But um, yeah, I totally beat myself up and. Um, the conservatory that, does that to you, man. Cause it really does say, and I'm not blaming anything. It's like a byproduct of a great thing in my opinion, but when you go to school and you don't major in something, but you're a conservatory actor for four years, acting, 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 yeah, whatever that ends up meaning to you, if you get out and you're not doing that, you're a fucking loser in your head. You're like, why did I, like, what was the point? And I told everybody, this is who I am. I told myself, this is who I am. And that means X, Y, Z. And now X, Y, Z, I'm like, who fucking cares about that at all? So wait, that means I don't care about myself. That means I lied to everyone. That means this was all bullshit or or whatever your version of it is. All right. So there's two things I want to talk about really quick before we run out of time. Um, I feel like we, we got the good and the imposter syndrome thing, uh, handled. Um, (laughs) so no, I I love this. I want to talk about two things. I want to talk about during the conversation we had the other day. Uh, a few weeks ago, whenever it was, we talked about the word clown, which we have dropped about a million times in this podcast. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And 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 I'll lay it out for everybody because if you're listening to this and you know School of the Arts, you went to School of the Arts in North Carolina, you might have some familiarity with this already. If you don't, you might have been hearing the word clown this whole time being like, am I supposed to know what that means? Because it doesn't sound like I know what it means based on what they're saying. Since when is Charlie <laughs> Chaplin a clown? That's not what he is. Right. But that we take for granted when we're studying with Francisconi, for example, that he literally says in class, you know, don't think about this isn't the birthday clown. This isn't the circus clown. It's a different kind of clown. We're talking about clowning as it as it pertains to people like Charlie Chaplin, people like even Andy Kaufman and people... Um, uh, there's, you know, uh, we talk about, uh, Jacques, there's so many examples of clowning. That's not what comes to mind when your mainstream audience hears clown, because I was telling you the other day, you're thinking Chaplin, they're thinking Pennywise. Exactly. They're, 
and and I have made a I'm not going to do my bit, but I used to have a bit about how <laughs> clowning and being a clown used to be a respectable kind of thing. It was like you were an artist, you were a performer, mm-hmm. you know, you were maybe even heralded as like, wow, he's like a person who knows comedy. Then this motherfucker named John Wayne Gacy <laughs> was a birthday clown who I believed mostly worked nonprofit and murdered a bunch of people, including children. <laughs> and then after that, and a lot of people don't realize he is the inspiration for Pennywise. He is, mm. he is, he is a lot of the credit of when clown turned scary. Now, mm. Bob used to point out. It's a conspiracy. Well, it was just a mistake <laughs> that was loud. <laughs> no, um, no. And a little murdery. And Bob used to point out, he was like, there is something disturbing about, you know, the main, let's talk about the main difference. We used to study clowning with a, a latex rubber, like red nose with a string. That was the whole, and it was the least obstructive of the face of all the mask work we did. We start by covering mm-hmm. our whole face. Then we start yeah. with a white mask on the front. Um, then we go to the half mask that's let your mouth free. Then finally yeah. the red nose, which is typically silent covers the least amount of your face and gives you the, the responsibility of the expression, right? Yeah. At no point in our clown training, though we learned how to juggle, at no point did we paint a fake smile onto our face and right. cover our face in white paint and and wear the like, you know, uh, fucking uh, mm-hmm. outfit that people think birthday clown, people think Pennywise, the red wig bozo. Yeah, we didn't. That wasn't part of our learning about clowns at all. Yeah, wasn't even part of it. You know what's interesting about that too, and uh, I may be there's partial truth to this, and um, um, but like a lot of that uh, makeup and stuff is is, and you could talk to Tanya Belov about this, who is one of our teachers at school. Is that in Russia, like the the clown that's in Russia is is still like to this day, there is not that stigma around right. the makeup and all that, and they still do that. Um, like the Slava scary Pol- clown shit didn't make it over there. No, and and that's why I said um, and you know, whoever's listening, like you can take this with a grain of salt, but that's why I say that's a bit of a conspiracy for America because Mm. I think possibly, and this is just a theory is that all the, all the fear that's put in clown with it. And like, it's anytime you see clown that's put in the space, it's like fear porn and like, you're like scary clown and all that in a weird way i think it's it's a way of like of of um a, a bit of control and not and not seeing the 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 deeper picture of why clown is actually like a beautiful positive thing and that we all have our own inner clown but it's that this whole fear porn thing is a it, it bastardizes the clown um the essence and the beauty of it and that's why I just say conspiracy is it it's certainly like, tarnishes it's a your great degree way to from people. clown school. Yeah. 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 And that's so to, and, and my, you know, the second half of that point is we go to school, maybe one of the most revered elements of our training other than like Shakespeare is mm-hmm. the clown work. You, I mean, we, we treat it with respect there's so many rules for when you went into 716 in the room with Bob and you're wearing exactly the right thing. There, you don't, you don't speak up at the wrong time. You don't just break an exercise and be like, I don't get that. You know, it's like <laughs> there's so much respect for what we're doing, and it gets baked into you from the very beginning that by the time you leave school, you're like you're just full of this love and respect for what it means to be a clown. And you go yeah. out into the world and you want to share that with people. But you're right in America. As soon as you say clown, half, maybe more of your yeah. audience is like, I'm out. I'm afraid of clowns. Done. I, I, that sentence, I am afraid of clowns, is super commonplace. Uh, what is it? Coulrophobia? There's a name for it. There's oh, like a they, specific <laughs> name for fear of clowns. American, American name that they created? <laughs> I, I guess so. At this point, it's probably in the 
the whatever that book, the DMC five or whatever the thing is where people <laughs> have clinical issues. It's yeah. documented. It's it, and people will tell you, "Hey, what are you afraid of? Heights, uh, clowns." The, it's on the list. Yeah. It's, it's on yeah. the top. Yeah, it's like the top five <laughs> things you'll hear, and you're like, "What other degree can you get in America that makes the top? You can't be a spider in undergrad." It's like <laughs> we have a degree. Well, you could you could these days. Who knows? <laughs> yeah, yeah, these days I don't want to. I don't want to be a spider. Ass, I don't want to assume what anyone identifies as. I'm just saying <laughs> that it's weird that we went to school for, got a degree in a thing that, on paper, when you just say it without any context, is like one of people's biggest fucking fears. Yeah, and yeah, yeah, yeah. Here you are leaving that program, going into the world, being like, I want to use this to bring joy to the world. And if you use the wrong word, they're not even going to give you a fucking chance. Yeah. They're not going to even hear you out because they're like, oh, I'm sorry. I'm afraid of that. And you're like, they're not going to hear you out when you're like, but you don't get you, it. I'm not John Wayne be. Gacy. Come on. Like, <laughs> yeah, exactly. See, it's like you're like changing them. Like, what do you, you that? That is where what is the word um, um, where it's like the artist that that uh, doesn't want to shape to the times. They're just like mm. um it's it's like the hipster indie kid that only drinks the like uh, only listens to the band until somebody else listens to it and they get rid of it. Yeah, they're contrarian. <laughs> contrarian, that's it. Yeah, a hundred percent. And so we were talking about that, and you had already come to that realization in, in different words. And you're like, I need to start calling myself a comedian. And I was like, mm. I think you're right, because comedian can be a lot of different things. You know, you see Melissa McCarthy as a comedic actress who almost exclusively at this point in her career does comedy movies. And people would say she's a comedian or a comedian mm. or however you want to put it. She doesn't just stand up. She doesn't, I don't think do a lot of improv anymore. She's a film. She's a movie star. That's what she is. But you hear comedian and you're like, that's not that wrong. Now, some people hear comedian, they're going to assume stand up comic or stand up comedian. You go to a yeah. mic and you tell us jokes about the airport and your kids. And that's the, those, that's what comedian is. But comedian yeah. has a lot more space and you've got their ear to give the context. Unfortunately, the word clown is so bastardized and so yeah. dirty. That it really is best to just call it something else and then go be a clown and they don't fucking yeah whatever, and, they don't know it. and also like off of your convert off of our conversation around the around comedian I am like in a space now and I and I do want to give a shout out to actually Andrew Jernigan um, who was a part of the Simpletons like uh, he was actually the first to put that in my brain about like transitioning out of the nose and like in the simpletons like trying things out without the nose that was like the first time it was like put into my brain about that um but like fast forwarding back to what i was talking about um uh uh can you remind me what i actually was talking about before i said that oh you were saying before you said that andrew was uh, transitioning yeah, yeah. out of it yeah uh before that we were talking about just how the word has been bastardized and clowning yeah, in general um, is a dirty word. Yeah. And so like with um, just using the word comedy, I've actually, I have decided to not even talk to the person about clown anymore. Um, not that, that, not that like, because I think clown is a beautiful world, but to talk about clown is a is is a very in my opinion a very spiritual conversation mm. um to 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 be honest because um when you just start to talk about like what is clown and you go deeper and deeper and deeper it really comes down to the inner kid yeah it comes down to the inner child yeah and what you find in in spaces that really know how to hold space and and are great clown teachers there's a lot of healing that happens in that space and same thing with acting like when you have a um like certain spaces like okay so and this is a great um segue into bob francisconi um is a neutral mask the neutral mask is is closely related to the red notes right and the neutral mass was one of the most emotional 
deep work you do in that class. It's like so much silence and stillness, stillness, silence. It goes into a place of emotional, uh, a lot of stuff comes up from you. And when you merge into the the clown world, the clown understands um, that uh, it, it is the kid. And with, and with that kid, it's, taking that neutral mask part and it's bringing the joy into it. Yeah. Because with, with the neutral mask comes that like inner work. And then when the clown nose comes out, it's about that joy. Um, There's a, there's a wonderful teacher that I, I only took one class with really want to take some more classes with him. His name is Christopher Bays. He, I think he teaches at Yale fantastic clown teacher. And one of the things he does, and I'm actually reading his book right now. Um, I think it's, where is it? It's how to become a clown Um, uh, or becoming a clown. I think it's what it's called. Uh, But it's, there is an exercise that he does. And I did this with him um, over zoom is it's um, going, uh, you're, you're laughing and you, it starts off feeling like inauthentic, but you're just really pushing yourself to laugh and you're bouncing off of other individuals too of laughing and then laughing more fully, laughing more fully. And that gets bigger until you're actually like full on laughing. What happens is that laughing turns into crying. Mm. And laughing and crying are literally like they're they're kin. I'm um, seeing Joaquin these, Phoenix right now. Mm, yeah, I'm seeing the Joker because that's really what yes. happens to him. That's exact. And so it's like yeah. that laughter and crying is it's a space of it's a space of inner like laughing is a healing space. Um, and whether you think it or not, and we can go to talk longer about the whole world of stand-up comics and, and the darkness that is there sure. within stand-up comics is that whether they know it or not, they're healers. Um, right. And, and if they're doing it in service for society, we're, we're healers. And so laughing has a space where it can literally, you can be laughing and it could actually unlock a part of you and then you're crying. And that exercise was really eye-opening for me with Christopher Bayes, where I was just like, oh my gosh, clown is, is a a space of healing. Um, and, and so I like, you can go back and forth from laughing, crying, laughing, crying, laughing, crying. And then you're just like completely like, you're just a, a wash conduit. of all of the, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So uh, I don't know why I ended. Oh, it's because uh, clown, the word clown. I, I tend to put a, um, put that on the side because most of the time people are not in a sense ready to have that conversation. Right. Now, when you meet somebody that can, it's like, by all means, and let's go. Like, um, it's, I love talking about it, but like when you, uh, so that's why I don't, I I've actually made the decision to not use that word when speaking to people about what I do anymore. Right. Because I think it's, um, let it be special to you and and honestly, that was to communicate. What's that? I said the time it would take to communicate what that means is, and And honestly, you were a a big inspiration off of that too, of really like solidifying, um, not using that. And it's, and it's not because it's a a bad word in my world. It's just, um, it's really helpful to, to know your niche, um, in, in what you're doing and to be able to really in service of others, understand, um, your audience, (laughs) in a sense. I love that so much. I know you got to go 60 seconds. What's coming up next for you, man? What are you up to? So, uh, right now I am, um, I'm in the process of creating a show called, this is an actual magic show and it's a comedy show. Um, it's there's, uh, uh, 
there's a lot of, of absurdism involved and there's a lot of celebration and um, I'm really looking forward to um, to touring that. Um, as well as that, I'm um, I am I'm in a part of a uh, the mastermind, which I mentioned at the very beginning. But it's literally I'm, I'm I'm working on um, making my business go live uh, and uh, with a couple more kinks and and things um, that will soon uh, be a reality. Or there is I'm really it is already. You, it's man. just time is catching up. Yeah, for sure. I'm super excited for you, dude. And I love the direction that it sounds like you're heading. And uh, one of the things I've always admired about you, and I, I continue to because it's clearly not changed, is despite what you may feel, which I can't speak to, what I observe from you is a fearlessness in your work mm-hmm. that says, "I man, to go just to go up." on stage at an open mic period is one of the scariest things that any most people can imagine doing in their lives. So I don't know if I can go stand on a mic while everyone expects me to be funny. And then you have the balls to get up at that same place and do nothing. So like <laughs> stand there and look at everyone for like minutes. Dude, uh, that takes some fucking cajones. It takes some serious huevos, my dude. And <laughs> I, I, I'm proud of you. I'm proud of the work oh, that you've done, brother, and I'm so proud much. to see the fearlessness with which you approach the work. And uh, you know, maybe dirty to everybody else, man, but you're one of my favorite clowns, my dude. And I can't wait to have you back on the show. It's gonna be fun. Oh, brother, thank you so much. I really, really um, appreciate you saying that. Of course, of course. I'll catch up soon. Yeah. Hell yeah. Thanks, dude.